Well, hello to all of you, and I'm super, super excited. I, uh, we, this is something that we've been working on for more than six months. So this journey began back in uh, August 2018 around the digital real estate mastermind. We speak so much about technology and property and how we bring it all together. And um, I'm really, really excited. Tonight, it's all culminating in the launch of the digital real estate mastermind. And so I've got a couple of things that I want to share with you uh, to get started. And then we're going to bring David in um, as our special guest tonight. And he's going to be sharing with us his insights as a global authority in terms of where the world's going. So let's go a little bit deeper around why this could be important to you. The first thing is that in 2018, a number of people asked the question, could blockchain be a bigger disruptor than the internet? Many people, myself included, actually believe that blockchain is going to have a bigger impact on your life in the next 20 years than the internet has in the last 20 years. Now that's a pretty big statement. If you went back to 1995 and someone sat down and said the internet is going to have a material change in your life, what would you have thought? Now fast forward 20 something years and someone's saying the blockchain is going to have an even bigger impact. What do you think of that? That's a pretty outlandish statement. But if it has any validity, then this is certainly something that you need to learn about. Here's another article on the fact that blockchain will be bigger than the internet. And this was from an investment banker. And then you got the complete opposite of that, which was an article that I was uh, sent yesterday on the 1.7 billion cryptocurrency that's been stolen and scammed in 2018. Now, just in my interest, and uh, I did the search this morning on Wikipedia, the internet.com bust lost $1.7 trillion, trillion with a T. So you've got to add an entire extra zero. And then you look at the forecasts, and this is quite an interesting graph because you basically are forecasting not only the the growth within blockchain related business value but also the investment so you can see the growth is the green line and it sort of goes up and it goes down so there's a lot of growth in 2018 2019 and you can see it actually waning and then growing again but which which is the typical uh, hype cycle but what's fascinating is the amount of money just steadily increases year on year um, into the effectively into the trillions of dollars. Uh, sorry, billions of dollars. Then the other thing that I wanted to share with you before David uh, joined, and um, some of you might know this, and if you do, I apologize. But a lot of people don't understand the difference between blockchain and cryptocurrency. And so this is a great table I found today where you're comparing blockchain and cryptocurrency. So the first one, if you look at nature, you know, blockchain is a technology that records transactions, whereas a cryptocurrency is a tool that is used in virtual exchanges. In terms of use, a blockchain records transactions. A cryptocurrency makes payments, investments, or as a storage of wealth. In terms of value, blockchain has monetary value. Cryptocurrency has no monetary value. And then in terms of mobility, blockchain can be transferred whereas cryptocurrency can't be transferred. And so I want to share with you two little videos just to get started. Some of you might or might not have seen this before. I've shared it a lot of times. But this is the best video that I've found on what the blockchain is. Let me share this with you quickly. Because it's very important that you understand the difference between blockchain and cryptocurrency before we get started with, with David around explaining that. This is the seller. This is the buyer. This is the middleman. Cutting out the middleman can be a great thing, unless you're the middleman. And there are a lot of middlemen or intermediaries out there. Entire industries, such as payments or securities clearing, have evolved to rely on them. Why? Because they establish trust where there is none. They establish ownership, that the seller has the right to sell what's being sold. 
They attest to history that there is a clean transaction history and they certify ability that the buyer has the money to buy it. All pretty critical details when you don't know the person on the other side of the transaction. Intermediaries know and trust one another. Their business is based on it, so they have more to lose than gain from breaching that trust. But what if there were a better, cheaper middleman? One that didn't add as much cost, complexity, and chance for error? There might be. It's called blockchain and it has the potential to disrupt the entire ecology of intermediaries. It's a distributed ledger that relies on large networks of computers that redundantly encode transaction data by solving complex mathematical equations. The secure ledger provides an inviolable record. If the history of an instrument is incorruptible and available to all parties, there's no need for a third party to vouch. Blockchain is proof of ownership, history, and ability in non-centralized encrypted form. It's fast, transparent, and free of error. The question is not whether blockchains can cut out the middlemen in complex transactions, but rather which middlemen and when. So let's go back to my main screen here and uh, you should be able to hear and see me now. So hopefully you enjoyed that little understanding of blockchain if you haven't seen it before and if you have seen it before, hopefully it was worth watching again. Now what about ICOs or cryptocurrencies? Now this is a, a graph that I got about a year ago and you can see what happened in 2014 when, when this sort of got going. Now I remember that Bitcoin was launched back in 2008, so this is even you know, six years after that. But this is when other cryptocurrencies started to emerge. So you can see Ethereum, which came out, or Ether that came out in 2014. Now, we're going to talk about this with David Alban. I mean, he was actually the very first investor in Ether. Um, and you can see 2015 was not a great year. Uh, Bitcoin crashed in that year. And then in 2016, it starts to grow again. You can see in the top left corner the amount of money that's actually raised uh, through token sales. So it starts to really... <laughs> expand quite a lot in 2016 and then you can see why the regulators got so excited in 2017 because look at what happened in 2017 And if anyone can find me a graph as to what happens uh, for the next year, <laughs> I would love that as well. But what's really interesting is that for me, it's all about the currency of the new economy, which is trust. And, um, you know, I learned this from Roger Hamilton. You basically got it's, it's social media. For others, but I cannot see your screen, actually. Can you uh, verify that if it is just me? Uh... Yeah, can, can you guys just let me know if, if you can't see the screen? I, it is telling me you can see the screen. <coughs> Thank you for letting me know, David. Um, if someone could just let us know quickly on the dashboard if, if you're seeing it. Um, yeah, so someone in, in Hawthorne is saying, yes, we can. Um, it's a little bit weird. So um, it, is, it is definitely showing on my side that, that they can see it. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know either way, David. So for me, what, what I was saying in terms of what Roger Hamilton taught me is that you take e-commerce and you take social media, you marry the two together and you get social commerce. And that foundation of social commerce where people are collaborating and investing and, and, and you know, being commercial together is, is trust. And blockchain ultimately forms that trust. So that's the one understanding that I think is re really important. The next understanding that's really important is that when in, whenever an industry is, is shaped, you know, whenever technology companies come in and, and completely redefine an industry. You can see what Uber's done to the taxi industry, Facebook's done to the media industry, Alibaba's done to the retail industry, or Airbnb's done to the accommodation industry. What I find really, really fascinating is that there's two things that you need to look for if you want to look for an industry which is going to be disrupted. The first is that there's a terrible customer experience. So think of you know catching a taxi before Uber. And the second is that it's very expensive and slow and, and inefficient. And when you consider those two things, 
and you go back to this little graph, which uh, again, you if you if you've been around me for a while, you you might or might not have seen. But what's really interesting to me is that it, it continues to to grow. If you look here in terms of the value and the number of companies that have been created, the the uh, the billion dollar companies that have been created since 2014. So this is tech companies um, where they've disrupted an entire industry. It's absolutely fascinating uh, what has been happening in, in these markets. So clearly something's happening. And clearly something around the world is, is materially changing uh, in terms of, you know, how industries are being completely reshaped and ultimately the value creation that that creates when an industry is, is being disrupted. You know, if you look at it and you take uh, exponential technologies, there are so many different types of exponential technologies and there's different sectors. And so I'm not going to go through them. But you know some of them big data internet of things artificial intelligence 3d printing drones robotics in the fintech you know side of things augmented economy blockchain which we're discussing tonight digital banking cryptocurrencies we're discussing tonight peer-to-peer -peer systems mobile banking virtual smartphones and then decentralized autonomous companies which uh next month actually paul Nieder is going to talk a lot about and then you know what's fascinating to me is that every single industry no matter what your job or your profession it will be disrupted by exponential technologies over the next 10 to 20 years and a great saying that i learned a couple of years ago is you really get a choice you can either uber yourself before you get kodak or you can join the likes of kodak that went bankrupt in 2012 as as the industry just completely changes as dr dolph de Rus said and you can see here there's a picture of of me and him back in 2012 and you know we'd had the the global crash and, and the property market in america there was tremendous opportunity and that was just another example of a tremendous opportunity. And he said at the time, there's three types of people. The first one watches what happens. The second one wonders what is happening. And the third one takes action and gets involved. And, you know, a classic example was in August 2012, we started buying properties in America. And the bottom of the market in America was literally within one month of when we started purchasing property in America. Now, whether we talk about property or whether we talk about technology, you know, we are learning tonight about some massive trends that are going to impact your life and you'll get to decide which type of person you want to be. There's another lesson that I love from history. And that's what I, you know, what, what, what is fascinating to me that in 1910, four out of the five top companies in America were railroad companies. And yet in 1910, Henry Ford, you know, launched and had his Model T car and they literally could have bought him for pennies on the pound. But they didn't. They didn't see him or you know, Ford Motor Company, or even transportation by road as a threat. And yet today, 80% of all uh, transportation around America today happens by truck. And the railroads have really become far more convenient for digging ditches next to them and putting in fiber optic cables. Now, for me, I find this absolutely fascinating because they are ultimately becoming the ox wagons of the 21st century, and yet, a hundred years ago, if they had looked at the long-term trends and what was happening, what could they have done differently? I want to share another video with you. And I'm not sure, David, you haven't even seen this video. I'm not sure how well this comes through. Now, just by the way, David is a, a faculty member of Singularity University uh, with Peter Diamantes, et cetera. But Hilda Lundestead, who's um, one of our you know, lead investors and one of our board members and you know, one of our oldest and, and most passionate uh, supporters, is actually at A360. And um, she literally videoed this just yesterday on where the future of real estate is going. And, and if this works, I would love to share this with you quickly. Pioneering work that's been done in the last 24 months around the legality, the regulatory issues, who's allowed to buy it, what type of accreditation do you need to be a buyer? To the, the SEC considers these things securities. You can't go out and just randomly sell it to everybody. Everybody starts buying fractional pieces of swampland in Florida. And because of marketing, 
you, the money flows off into crime and graft. So what you have is you have a kind of well-advised set of constraints within which you can now work, and there's a lot of clarity coming up. In fact, it's only in the next, say, three months, not three years, that the first real security token exchanges are coming online. Now, they won't have a lot of volume at first, so people are going to do what they always do with new technologies and say, well, why would I want that? Like with the internet, why would I want to watch it? You know, video that's a postage stamp. Well, because it's not always going to be a postage stamp. The volume's going to start to grow exponentially. And in the coming years, you're going to find that most real estate will be done this way. Why wouldn't you? Why would you put money into something that has a lockup until somebody happens to buy it in some future uh, uh, time frame that you have no control of when you can buy into uh, at, at a very small amount and get out of it? So it's also going to democratize ownership. When you see a skyscraper going up, it's usually for millionaires and billionaires. If you have a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars and you want to put it in, and then you feel like you've made your money when it's worth hundred and twenty dollars, you can take it out. Most of the liquidity around real estate and illiquid assets is going to move this direction because it's just so sensible. It's hard to do it any other way. We talked about the six Ds, right? And it's really the digitization of real estate. Um, and that we're dematerializing it in one sense, both in this fashion and the virtual fashion. Philip and I talk all the time about having a, you know, you need to have a virtual representation of your building as well in a virtual world that people will go and visit and use. There'll be one authentic one that you can potentially own, just like it's a .com URL. Uh, and that's democratizing and it's demonetizing access to these things, right? So. Those six Ds are gonna play out across every industry, and you may not imagine it yet in whatever industry, that people say, well, how are you gonna demonetize and, de and dematerialize my building? Watch, it's, this is what's going on. But we need to set it up, though. Do how, does, how, how do I, Sasha, set it up? Right, how so there's different a, roles. So let's say, to figure out. so do you wanna build a business that uh, goes out and buys real estate and, and then fractionalizes it and sells it, or do you wanna be a buyer of real estate? And, and be one of the people that actually is speculating? Like, what role do you want to play? I want to go to the developer, owner of land, and say, hey, your building's worth 100 million right now. I can make it worth 700 million. I have the process in place. I have all the licenses. I have the bank yeah. structures. I have the, so how do, how do I so, do that? So you can do that right now, all the pieces, other than the 700 million. And what, what I'd say about that is the, <laughs> the speculative nature of utility coins, which is backed only based on kind of hopes and dreams, will be replaced by a much lower volatility around a real world asset. So when something is generally known to be worth $100 million, it's very rare that you're gonna find a liquid market of people agreeing that it's maybe worth $700 million and go insane. So it's gonna trade within a certain band. So it's no, the get rich, rich quick schemes of the former kind of frenzy of crypto is not gonna to apply to these. What will apply is liquidity in a much wider base of democratization of ownership. So you can start right away simply by sitting down with the attorneys that are actually knowledgeable in this space and the accountants and the, the representatives who have now done this pioneering work and I can make those intros to you. And the time is right. This is, this is absolutely wide open to get into. And Eric will be here today and tomorrow. Uh, let's go to Adam. Uh, uh, video that was sent just yesterday by by Hilda. You know, for me, if I um, if I look at it, and if you look at the real estate industry, it's a 228. I mean, I've seen 217 trillion. This this article says 228 trillion uh, dollar markets. It, it's not a case of if it's going to be disrupted. It's merely a case of when. And you know, some of the things that we just discussed there were really interesting. I mean, this is the 60s that that Peter Diamantes was talking about in that video. And you know, again, if uh, if you know, maybe David, um, you know, people want questions, could go deeper into this. But you know, we are very much only in the deceptive phase at the moment. We haven't, when it comes to property or real estate, <coughs> technology has not gone into the disruptive phase yet, and people don't even see it coming. The, the real estate industry doesn't see it coming. The traditional property industry players don't see it coming, and this is why it becomes so important in terms of what we're doing. It's something I've been passionate about my entire life. You know, when I was six years old, uh, my parents bought me a Commodore 64 and I learned to program uh, using Logo or the Little Turtle, if you know what that is. You know, when I was 13, my dad uh, got me into my first property project. Uh, you know, I basically studied an honors degree and a master's degree, uh, cum laude, both, uh, both from Cape Town and London in terms of how technology was going to change the construction and property uh, real estate industry. 
you know, we've, we've run two successful companies in both IPS and wealth migrates in terms of marrying together these two industries between technology and property. And we've got a very, very um, passionate team that has tremendous experience in different realms of the space as we can as we can bring it all together. And so without further ado, I wanted to launch the digital real estate mastermind, which is ultimately bringing together in simple terms, technology and real estate. And every single month, looking at that intersection, how it evolves, where are the opportunities, what can you as an individual learn, what can you do about it, and, and most importantly, how can you take advantage? And so it's with a huge amount of honor that I wanted to welcome David, who, who literally is, is one of the most knowledgeable people that I've ever met around the world, in, in not just in crypto, but in multiple different areas. You know, he was, as I mentioned already, the first person to invest in Ether. He runs his own venture capitalist uh, company, Network Society Ventures, um, out of New York, and they, they actually very kindly invested in us um, about 12 or 18 months ago. He's a faculty member of Singularity University, which you know you just saw there with Peter Diamantes. And I would certainly consider David a global authority in blockchain, crypto, exponential technologies, and I'm sure many more things that people would add to that. I've seen him speak all over the world, um, literally had the privilege of watching him speak. And every single time you speak, David, it absolutely fascinates me. And it's with a huge honor and privilege that I wanted to really welcome you uh, tonight, you know, as, as, as really our first authority in this digital real estate uh, mastermind. And so welcome. It's, it's truly a, a privilege to have you tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Uh, these are as well. Uh, always uh, great interacting with you uh, and, uh, and, and a group of people assemble. Uh, at the opportunity uh, to actually go on tour with you in, uh, in uh, Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durham, and uh, at every stop we had uh, only fascinating. Uh, between each of us uh, together with uh, so I hope that uh, in the webinar today we will have uh, maybe some time for uh, who uh, are very uh, but I am also here about the craft that you um, thought would be the, the most important to start with uh, learning actionable knowledge today is really a key because uh, the culture uh, is uh, arriving in front of us so rapidly uh, that uh, we, we cannot rely on on the wisdom of uh, uh, ancient knowledge we really have to get dirty and an experiment and understand uh, the, the value of uh, and, and i think Part of the reason digital technologies uh, such a success is because they lower the barrier to this expectation. Uh, so David? many things that. Uh, David, so uh, can I, David, can I jump in quickly? There's some reason the sound's not coming through too clearly. I'm not sure if you want to try and switch off your. Um, your video, basically. It's, I, I'm not sure. It's a couple of people. I thought it might just be me, but at, at least five or six people have. Uh, have mentioned that, so I'm wondering if we just, if we maybe just switch off your 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 video, if it will work better. And so, uh, I, I was saying that bit of echo from yours. Maybe if you mute, uh, talking. Perfect. I'll mute on my side. And um, so, the uh, the opportunity of digital technologies uh, in general. Uh, is uh, to offer this uh, kind of experimentation to everybody and anybody. The only thing that you need to do is to, to want it. And, and moving from a stationary passive stance to an active engaged uh, uh, position. And, and, and you know, uh, anybody who is on this webinar have already made that first step. Because they decided, rather than having a, a coffee and and uh, uh, you know watch TV or, or or whatever else, I want to learn. I want to get engaged. I want to get my brain provoked uh, 
uh, through whatever Scott and David are going to tell me. So, so I, I, I thank you for getting me involved in this. I am very excited and looking forward both to the next, uh, uh, you know, um, hour or so together, as well as whatever is going to happen afterwards. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, David. And thanks. It's it's much much better now. Um, um, I don't know. I don't quite not quite sure what uh, uh, what changed, but it's much much better. So thank you very much for that. So what I what I thought and uh, where my sort of uh, we're, we're chatting with the team and whatever was that you and I did a couple of webinars, ironically in January 2018, and then we did the roadshow in March uh, 2018, roughly. And um, you know that feels like a decade ago in the crypto blockchain <laughs> world. If you if you take that, I mean. A hell of a lot has happened in the uh, in the last uh, year, and so my suggestion was I've got a couple of questions that I would like to uh, run through with you, and I'm actually want, proposing I follow a fairly similar structure to what I what I did um, basically 12 months ago because it's almost to see where we were and where we are now, and then equally if people want to participate and ask questions if they just want to put it in the uh, in the chat box, and if it's relevant I'll I'll jump in and ask at the time or I'll I'll sort of keep it for a Q and A at the end. Are you happy with that? Yes, that is perfectly perfect. Perfect. So, so the big question that, uh, that a lot of people, I believe, don't still fully understand is that, you know, why is blockchain uh, such a game changer? What, what is it that, is it all hype or is it uh, something that people really need to, you know, spend time understanding? So, uh, I believe it is very useful uh, analogy. And, and, and please mute if you can. Um, analogy is uh, with uh, the, the internet. The internet was uh, something completely new that uh, a lot of people could not understand for a long time. Sears catalogs were ubiquitous. Uh, they represented the shopping experience in rural America for a hundred years. When did they stop shipping, printing and shipping Sears catalogs? Right around the time when Amazon was being born. At the beginning of the 90s, Sears gave up and said, nobody will want to browse for products to be bought. And they were so wrong. It's just that the medium would change. People would browse for buying products, but rather than on the paper catalog, they would browse in their browsers online. And of course, Amazon didn't become the giant it is today for a long time, but definitely people now understand that e-commerce is here to stay. So, Blockchain makes possible things that could be done previously too, but the way that we are going to do them in the future will be uh, so much more convenient that we will start even forgetting how it was before blockchain. And there are so many applications of this uh, uh, possibility, um, really. Um, people are busy all over the world rethinking in their own industry, in their own business model, how blockchain is uh, going to um, uh, impact it. And now, I, I uh, will not enter into the technical details, but it is, I think, important to highlight that um, the first application of blockchain, which is Bitcoin, brings together many, many different threads, many different developments, and a few real mathematical innovations that make um, things that, that didn't quite work before all of these components came together in something that is beautifully complete. And, and I'm sure some of the, the, the questions that you will ask me uh, uh, further will allow me to highlight uh, what, what this is. 
let me just conclude answering your first question with confirming that before blockchain we needed centralized authorities imposing uh, on participants uh, the rules and the trust that they couldn't uh, achieve without that centralized authority. With blockchain, participation in a decentralized network for whatever goal is possible in absence of the imposition of the centralized authority. Sorry, I was talking away and then realized I was muted. And what's your take just before I move to the next question on the you know, statements like blockchain uh, could or, or, or maybe will be bigger than the internet? Uh, do you think it's got validity? Absolutely. Um, the very nature of exponential change uh, implies that we are building on previous achievements and on top of these achievements uh, our um, panorama becomes wider our ambition becomes stronger and we realize how much more is possible uh, it is really like climbing a mountain and then when you are on the top uh, after having thought that, that you are done, you realize that there are much higher, much bigger mountains to, to climb. So let's move to the next question. That um, What I find fascinating is about a year ago, and maybe even 2017, a lot of people would have said that we were on a wild goose chase, you know, particularly in the property industry and blockchain and, you know, etc and um you know we actually started in blockchain we went live in october 2016. there's a lot of mainstream companies that are now getting involved in blockchain and not only the banks and i just put up a bunch of uh, a bunch of logos here what's been your experience in the last year i mean i know that you're at the tipping edge of talking to a lot of them and you know uh, even from a consultancy perspective what's been your experience in terms of you know fortune 500 mainstream businesses getting involved so um a, a lot of people envy these these companies because of course they have a lot of resources but not a lot of people realize that the challenges are as big as the resources that you are uh you, you have available and the responsibilities towards your employees towards your shareholders towards your customers uh, this is what creates hype and there are many technologies that go through the hype cycle, and then some of them deliver on, the, on their promises, some faster, some more slowly. The fundamental reason why uh, uh, large companies feel that they, they have to be in, in blockchain is because they know they cannot afford not to be there. Let me give you an example. Um, I actually was updating some of my slides. Um, uh, maybe I can show it to you because I have a book about AI and, and uh, uh, one of the illustrations uh, is, is a slide from my, from my deck. Um, I don't know if you can see it well here, probably not well, but you can see it a little bit. Uh, this is a comparison of various uh, uh, digital assistants speech recognition, interactive conversational agents. And this book came out three years ago. And I'm talking about Siri from Apple, Google Now from Google, and Cortana from Microsoft. Three of the largest technology companies that today are dwarfed in this explosively emerging market by Alexa from Amazon. And if three years ago you asked any of these companies, who is gonna be the leader in conversational interfaces, in digital assistance, each of them would have said, oh, I hope it's me, but if not, probably it will be one of the two other guys. None of them would have said, oh, the people selling books over uh, the internet are gonna be the leaders in this completely new market, right? 
this kind of inherent uncertainty about the future is what forces large companies to get out there, get their hands dirty, and experiment because they cannot afford not to do that. They have to buy a stake in the future that is being built uh, by them, by their competitors, but also by the small guys. Because the probability that they will be uh, dominating uh, blockchain is literally zero. Those that say, oh, whatever we are building, you know, that is going to be the equivalent of Microsoft's Windows for, for uh, blockchain. Can't, can't happen. Can't happen will not happen. Uh, so they have to really worry. The, the, the incumbents have to be afraid of their positions because blockchain is going to, to disrupt it. Wow. Oh. So my next question, and um, you know, you're a very interesting character in the space because you're very well, well, well versed, not just in one area, so not just crypto or blockchain, but actually exponential technologies in general. Um, and and you know I don't know if you if you're comfortable with me telling, but I mean you've even the last time I saw you, you've actually got a chip in your hand, you know, so that you you know the whole uh, Internet of Things and everything else, you know, you you don't just talk about it, you actually physically have it. So my question to you is that you know even if you take the last 12 months, things have rapidly moved on and adapted and changed. You know what impact do you see um, you know exponential technologies having? And again, I know it's quite a broad question. So, you know, maybe maybe let's take it fairly broad and if there's any big things you think, but but specifically for me in the sort of the fintech, um, you know, investment space. Um, we remember when we had rotary phones, or some of us do, and we used them to make calls. My phone today is completely and constantly muted. Anybody calling me, if I happen to glance at it, I may respond. Even though I keep my phone in my hand all the time to do whatever else, I almost never talk on my phone. Not only that, but my phone talks to my watch, talks to my computer, talks to my smart speaker, talks to my thermostat. One of the defining parameters of the future is going to be that contrary to what was possible up to the recent past, if useful, each of these pieces of conversation will represent an economic transaction which will be blockchain based. What does this mean? Let me give you a little story from the future. You are sitting in your home and you are uh, eating a piece of snack, whatever type of uh, uh, prepared, uh, you know, sweet or, or, or cookie. And as you open the wrapper, you throw it away and you would think, oh my God, no, trash, no. Because there is an eager robotic hand that catches the piece of wrapper that in the past, today, we would have called trash. Very excitedly looks at it, analyzes it, and immediately calls a self-driving platform. Not a two-ton SUV that is transporting human-shaped atoms today, self-driving transportation is going to be for atoms shaped at anything. Vanishingly small uh, instances of transportation will be for people. So this self-driving platform arrives, the piece of wrapper gets deposited by the robotic hand, and in the meantime, the two have negotiated the nano transaction that measures the value of this piece of material ready to be recycled that in the past today we would have called trash. 
and wrapper by wrapper, transaction by transaction, you are basically uh, starting to um, uh, to to diminish the cost of living in your home through the very fact of living in it. And each of these things that I just mentioned, the sensors, the robotic arm, the self-driving platform, the nano transactions, is something that you can glimpse and they will come together within the next 20 years to radically change um, what we understand about housing, living, sustainability, uh, financial support, and, and the various technologies that you are listing on these slides, AI, big data, uh, 3D printing, IoT, autonomous cars, all of them are involved in this little story that I just uh, described you. Oh, <laughs> That's, I mean, I'm still going to try and get my head about that, with a little autonomous vehicle coming out to uh, pick up my wrapper. So, uh, wow, that's uh, that's quite a thought, really. So let's uh, let's pivot into um, the question that 18 months ago was on everyone's mouth. In fact, it was probably in every coffee shop conversation, and uh, and now no one really talks about it <laughs> in any way. So uh, just two seconds. Good night, Mikey. Good night. Sleep well, okay. Sorry, just bedtime. Um, but um, yeah, what what are your thoughts, David, on uh, Bitcoin? I know you were a very early investor. I've heard you before talk about the ups and the downs, and this is just another up and a down. I'm sure you know. But 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 yeah, what are your thoughts? Uh, for for a lot of people, uh, this is their first down. <laughs> they got involved in late 2017. So well, um, I believe in the long-term value uh, of blockchain whose first embodiment has been bitcoin and bitcoin uh, by network value is still uh, the most important um, uh, piece of, of of this experiment that that we are running on a worldwide basis um yes i i i started talking about bitcoin Bitcoin, uh, uh, when it was um, of a different price than, than today. And, and people would listen to me at conferences and then come back maybe a year later and say, oh my God, if I only listen to you, David, now Bitcoin is $10, it's too late. Uh, and, and then they would say maybe some other people uh, some, some time after that, oh, now it's $100, it's too late. So the question, for many people is, is there a way to calculate what the Bitcoin price should be, and then to be able to bet on, on, on whether that price is, is higher than um, what the market says, and so believe that, that Bitcoin will increase in value compared to um, the dollar, the euro, or the rand, uh, or to, to, to say, no, actually, the price should be lower and bet on the fact that Bitcoin will, will decrease. So I am uh, of, of, the, of the school of thought that, that links the, the technologies that we just mentioned, the AI, Internet of Things, uh, autonomous cars, robotics, and many others together. Uh, where the ability to have um, genuinely internet compatible economic transactions is so big, where the ability to store digital money, some people would call it digital gold, uh, which uh, we call Bitcoin in a way that is completely under our own control, rather than having to trust a central government, a banking institution, or any other kind of authority. These, just these two things are already 
so advantageous as to practically guarantee the future for blockchain and, and Bitcoin as well. Now, does that mean that people should trust me to, to put their savings into Bitcoin? Not at all. I don't want anybody to rely on, on investment advice from you, from me, uh, because uh, it, it wouldn't be right. It, maybe Bitcoin will take another two, three years before it uh, recovers, before the exchange rate exceeds the peaks that we have seen December, January timeframe last year. But I believe that uh, it is intrinsically natural for this to happen. Whether it is a year or two or three, Bitcoin's value is likely to appreciate. Uh, and there are people who calculate a very natural and actually multiple different types of calculations for relatively modest uptakes of, of, of Bitcoin by the number of people, number of transactions um, or, or value stored in the Bitcoin network uh, to make it equivalent to one to three hundred thousand dollars. So over the longer term, there are people who believe that this is the value that Bitcoin is going to have. And, and I happen to be one of those people. Sorry, so tell me in terms of, you know, not just Bitcoin, but in terms of cryptocurrencies in general, is there an easy way that you can explain, other than purely the hype cycle, why it went up so much in 2017 and then crashed so badly in 2018? I mean, is it purely the hype cycle that everyone talks about, you know, whether it's the Gardner hype cycle or whatever, or is there more to it? Um, the network effect is is real, both in the good and in the bad. And uh, in the past, uh, network effects would be uh, dampened by very natural barriers for them to be so clearly visible. Uh, whether it is the geographical barrier for a technology uh, to spread. Uh, whether it is the language barrier for an idea to take hold. Today's world is so intimately interconnected that technologies and ideas spread um, very, very rapidly. And networks have self-reinforcing um, characteristics. Uh, if uh, uh, I uh, buy uh, Bitcoin and it goes up and you see that and I'm enthusiastically talking uh, to you about it, you will buy it too and other we will, people will do uh, so as well. Now, what happened um, is that uh, the markets are still not mature enough. Uh, they are not, they don't have enough liquidity, they don't have, have enough, enough depth, uh, and the, the, the cycles can be rather easily broken. Um, without necessarily pointing fingers, it was the SEC breaking the cycle. Uh, uh, and I'm pointing not one, but two fingers. Uh, the Securities Exchange uh, Commission of the United States um, did not, still to this date, issue any uh, guidance that is more than somebody talking at a conference, a blog post, or other obscure, not regulatory um, communication. What they did is to apply the good old FUD method, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, because blockchain and Bitcoin are profoundly disruptive 
to their centralized and hierarchical approach in controlling financial flows, who can invest in what, what are the rules around investing, and they are ready to uh, protect the past and give up the future. Um, the only thing that they told the world is that a uh, hundred years old regulation is what applies uh, called the Howey test. And there is nothing else to be learned about what a financial instrument can be, what a monetary instrument uh, can be, how securities should be uh promoted uh, bought and sold nothing new under the sun not today not tomorrow and this kind of obsessive um position is what killed kodak that couldn't believe in the digital camera even if they invented it uh, it is what killed uh, sears and their catalog that didn't see the internet coming and uh, um, the SEC is busy killing the US financial system because blockchain will dominate unstoppably. It is not gonna be next year, it is not gonna be maybe in five years, but um, the new financial system and all the wealth that is uh, created around it uh, is not going to come from past technologies, past platforms, and regulators that protect the past. Wow, uh, that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I mean, for me, it leads pretty well into sort of the very next question, which is where do you see it going? You know, again, I understand that's how long's a piece of string, but um, how do you see it changing over the next, you know, let's call it short, medium, and long term? So uh, in the short term, and, and I don't know whether we have specific questions around this, um, the market uh, adapts extremely rapidly. You know, if uh, somebody told uh, um, Henry Ford that the internal combustion engine was illegal, he would have had a hard time coming up with an alternative way to build a car company. Um, even though at the time electric cars already existed uh, there are really a lot of things that would have made the car much less uh, viable than it was given the en energy density of of uh, um, oil and, and gas which uh, fueled our cars for for the past hundred years today uh, in our interconnected digital world, prohibitions exert evolutionary pressure on new solutions that are found over and over and over again. So what is the new solution that was found rather than the ICOs of 2017 and, and uh, to a smaller degree 2018, now people are talking about STOs and the security tokens and the security token offerings are all the rage, especially in the United States, because they got at least partial blessing from the SEC. So in the short term, that will be the new way. OK, fine. I am not personally very excited about them, but OK. In the medium term, what matters is not the utility token or the security token or, or the cryptocurrency exchanges. Uh, what matters is what are the business models that we can experiment, implement, and sustainably uh, support that thrive in a blockchain world and in a tokenized world. And, and there are people who try to, to do that. 
the decentralized organization concept that uh, will be the uh, subject of uh, one of the forthcoming webinars is an important series of experiments in that direction. In the long term, I believe that uh, not having blockchain and tokens in your business and in your business model will be as suspicious as somebody today telling you that they have a thriving business and they have no website. It's possible, but you will immediately go like, oh, wow, what are you hiding? What's the problem? What is so strange? Uh, whether it is a, a, a restaurant that believes that the secrecy of not being able to be found uh, on Google Maps uh, is an advantage, or whether it is uh, a, a, an investment fund uh, that uh, uh, only wants uh, dictators and crooks money, uh, you know, today it happens. In the future, there will be businesses that don't use blockchain and tokens and they do the business uh, in their old ways, but they will be a vanishingly small minority. And in the long term, we will go back and say, oh my God, you mean the cap tables and the shareholders roster was not kept on a transparent and provable system? And that every time you had to admit a new investor, the KYC procedures didn't take a fraction of a second. You mean the stock market closed on weekends? You mean uh, the, 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 the car didn't alert uh, the repair shop that maybe in a week it needed to come in and by themselves agreed with the insurance company to cover everything? People had to waste their lives to do that stuff. These things will be so entrenched that the alternative will be seen as barbaric. That's uh, well, very, very fascinating. I wanted to share this with you, and and uh, you know, not so much get your opinion on it, but just your thoughts, really. Um, so we did a webinar two weeks ago with a guy called James Painter. He actually wrote. Uh, chapter two in my book, Property Going Global. Now, I followed the man for more than 10 years and actually he's been phenomenally accurate in terms of predicting currencies. So not, uh, not cryptocurrencies, but fiat currencies. And what's really interesting is that the way he does it is he takes sentiment to account and it's a bit like um, the weatherman and the way the weatherman spots patterns and then based on patterns that occur, he can, he can sort of uh, predict where things go. And he shared two weeks ago, which I found absolutely fascinating. If you look at this slide, he actually shared here that, um, that sorry, what are you seeing? Can you see my mouse? I just wanted to see if you can see my mouse. Can, yeah, my mouse here. He basically shared, like, here's the where we hit nearly $20,000, and then we go down to about uh, $3,000. And you can actually see here, this is sort of around uh, mid-2019. And then it actually goes back up. To between forty-five and sort of sixty-six thousand um, dollars. So, so his logic over the next two years is that Bitcoin is going to go up to call it fifty thousand dollars plus minus, and then it's going to have another correction uh, back down to even a thousand dollars. Now, it's just interesting. Like, again, <laughs> don't shoot the messenger. But I, I, I will say one thing, and to put this into perspective, you know, this guy's called the Rand as an example. And, you know, he said the RAND would strengthen against the dollar. And I was like, dude, like our government is in a mess. Like, I don't know what you talk about. And sure as anything, it, you know, he, he, he gets it right. So I just, you know, I'm just putting it out there. It's quite interesting. Um, and he's not saying it'll go to naught here. Yeah? Again, it, it recovers and goes back, but it's based on trend lines. Uh, it will be fascinating. Uh, uh, these lines um, are, and, and I don't know whether that is his methodology, uh, sometimes uh, um, in illustrating uh, an approach called technical analysis, and and uh, to me it, it is it is uh, it, it's not something that I I do or I I am able to to comment on, uh, but for me the fundamental value of of Bitcoin is is here to stay, and uh, 
you know, if you look at the 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 dollar, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank has been established a hundred years ago, and its charter is to protect the dollar's value. And if you look at the dollar's value as compared to a basket of goods, the Federal Reserve Bank in its hundred year history uh, has been able to do its job with the dollar losing 98% plus of its value, right? So we have the example, we know one of the most important economies in the world, one of the most important currencies in the world, one of the most powerful financial institutions of the world did its job to the point where rather than maintaining or slowly declining or, or I don't know what, but 19% loss of value. So compared to that, the other currencies did worse, right? And, and compared to that, do you really think that the, the 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 algorithm of Bitcoin that is designed publicly known, something that people cannot tinker with, that politicians cannot um, influence, that cannot serve special interests, but the global desire to preserve wealth, to transact without um limitations to um enable transparent um, and secure uh, economic exchange and communication worldwide do you think this is going to have a future i believe it is going to have a, a very very important future david what risks are you looking at you know, my uncle taught me a long time ago, I was about 20 years old, and he said, Scott, um, in life, you must always determine what the risks are. What's the worst case scenario? And if I can manage that, then everything else is upside. What risks are on your radar? And so the, the global interconnected infrastructure that we have built uh, is very complex a lot of people don't realize how delicate it is that intervening uh with very very blunt instruments that belong to a previous era to talk about uh how the global economy works without understanding it and with the power to impose sanctions and trade barriers where the unintended consequences uh, manifest themselves with tremendous speed, that is a huge risk. Um, the globally interconnected supply chains created enormous wealth that didn't only enrich billionaires, it created the incredible progress uh, that we have seen in reducing global poverty, in improving maternal health, in reducing infant mortality. That is the achievement of our global civilization. And it can be destroyed. Um, Another example, more specifically around the blockchain and Bitcoin experiments, is that even though uh, the network of calculations that re is required in order to secure the transactions, provably by anybody, is fairly decentralized, the source of the computers that do those very very specialized calculations powerful specialized computers is extremely concentrated in china we call the first process mining bitcoin mining and the second are the producers of the bitcoin mining 
cards, computer, specialized computers that are put in small or big data centers. So a huge risk is if the government of China one day decides that exporting Bitcoin mining hardware outside of mainland China is a capital offense. They can do that and they would immediately concentrate mining power within China with the ability to corrupt, control, and potentially destroy the Bitcoin network. So one of the things that I am working on personally is to build alternative hardware sources that do not depend on the Chinese supply chain so that uh, if the Chinese government were to try something like this, it couldn't be executed successfully. So it's one of those uh, classic examples of you don't even know what you don't know. <laughs> As in, uh, you know, I, I think of the risks and, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, a take on, on, on quite a big risk. You spoke a little bit about STOs already and you actually said you're not that excited about them. Um, you know, security, security tokens, coins, etc. What do you explain that one a little bit more in a little bit more depth? I mean, again, a year ago, you know, my understanding when you and I sat and even around the wealthy coin was that, you know, our intention is always to be a security token, but we had to wait for the regulator to be ready. We had to wait for, you know, the exchanges to come online. And obviously with the volatility, um, you know, I even played in that video, they still, still only just coming online. What's your thoughts on it? And, and you know, if you're not excited, why not? Sure. So, um, you know, uh, the wealthy token uh, uh, lives uh, in, a, in a jurisdiction that uh, many people have not even heard about uh, and, and they would have a hard time pointing it out on a map because uh, from a legal point of view, it is the jurisdiction of Malta uh, and the Malta has been uh, extremely uh, innovative in designing the regulatory framework that recognized that utility tokens have a role, contrary to the SEC that says, no, 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 there is no such a thing. Um, security tokens are the result of taking an airplane, clipping its wings, clipping its nose and tail uh, and uh, then putting it in a box and calling it a truck or a car. That is what a security token is. Um, if you take it out of that box, it can do all kinds of things that obviously if you cut its tail and nose and whatever else it cannot do, it can do what a truck does. Now, the fact that our shares, our ledgers, uh, our exchanges are not completely digitized yet is completely mind-blowingly laughable. And, and, and you know, uh, I am not closely associated uh, with uh, the um, uh, with NASDAQ or, or the New York Stock Exchange or, or, or whatever else and, and the players there. But if I were, I would be so ashamed at how backwards the whole thing is. I already gave a few examples, right, of, of the fact that, that, uh, that the market closes and everybody goes to sleep and that on weekends there is no trading. This is, this is completely absurd. So security tokens are the first very humble step in the right direction where traditional shares uh, become digital and the platforms hopefully uh, do what they should do too. Now, the first officially sanctioned security token platform came live in the United States a few uh, days ago. It's called T0. And if you go to t0.com, don't go there with great hopes because it doesn't deliver 
you need to be an accredited investor to trade. The accreditation process takes many, many days. The platform doesn't allow to trade after hours or over the weekend. So what are we doing? And it took them two years to start to set it up. Now, will all these kings be worked out? Yes. And it will take many more years. And in the meantime, it is all innovation that is not happening, right? So that is why, uh, just as uh, Amazon could outcompete Sears, a giant of its time, today, regulatory innovation is what matters. That is why small, nimble, regulatory jurisdictions such as Malta are winning because they can attract anybody to take advantage of the clarity that they offer and as an illustration the largest uh, token exchange in the world and the largest bitcoin exchange in the world called called Binance moved from China to Malta not only as, as their legal uh, headquarters, but even they moved the people. The CEO moved. So um, I, I believe that security tokens are going to play an important role. And trillions of dollars of value will move into security tokens. Absolutely. Uh, because they represent digital share uh, ownership. But I also believe that much more will come in from unexpected directions and that airplanes with wings that can fly are more exciting than airplanes with clipped wings in small boxes. Well, firstly, David, thanks for uh, making sure that we were based in Malta. <laughs> so uh, really, really appreciate that. Um, and I know you were in Malta just last week when we spoke. My next question, I've got two, two last questions. My next question is that with regards to the digital real estate mastermind, we always want to be bringing all the technologies back to the property real estate industry, whichever word people resonate with. What is your take on, again, let's use the short, medium and long term around whether it's blockchain or crypto or other exponentials, specifically when it comes to the property real estate industry? Um, you know, it's one of the oldest and most archaic in the world, like I've already spoken about. What do you think is going to happen in this industry? So uh, in the short term, reality is already here and it is represented by Wealth Migrate. People can uh, diversify their investment strategy, their wealth preservation strategy, including uh, the types of investments that they would have never thought could be included. Um, high quality um commercial buildings in the us high high quality exciting apartments in london um all kinds of uh, real estate investment opportunities become available to a much broader group of people than not those who could afford to set up all the infrastructure that would have been needed previously in order to do the same thing so this is what is already happening today, and it is made more efficient, uh, more accessible, thanks to blockchain uh, on, on the uh, Wealth Migrate platform as well. And the kind of integration that the evolution of the platform is going to represent within the next six months, within the next year, is going to make this even more uh, exciting, uh, even easier, uh, in the sign-up process, in the KYC process, in, in uh, deciding how to connect your personal funds to the platform to then make uh, immediate investment decisions, in the reporting that you receive, the transparency, the verifiability of everything that is going on. So all of this is already here now and it is represented by, by Wealth Migrate. In the medium term, I see um, the entire real estate market 
uh, to uh, adopt wholesale blockchain technologies for the simplest reason that it is better, it is more efficient in terms of tracing ownership, in terms of transferring ownership, whether the entire thing or fractional, uh, in terms of uh, starting to think about the life cycle of a building. Uh, this kind of transparency and accountability and efficiency doesn't have to start only when the building is done. Why cannot it start with the, all, all the um, uh, supply chains and the vendor relationships? Uh, and, uh, and, and why couldn't I uh, replay in virtual reality how the building gets uh, put together um, fast forward until it's done and anytime I slow it down and I click on a component, I can trace and I can verify that indeed the marble comes from Italy, that indeed the, the cables that were put in are high quality, that indeed the air filters produce the clean air I want uh, to, to breathe and so on. This type of accountability and transparency and traceability um, is a nice to have in many places. It is a must have in others like India. In India, uh, real estate is so corrupt that there are 20 million uh, court cases pending for uh, uh, houses and, and apartments that people bought and after a few months or a year somebody came around and said ha ha sorry that thing is mine you thought you had it but here is a potentially falsified uh, deed or or uh, record that that says that that it is not right so imagine it, how much um, investment is not happening because people realizing this. Imagine the inefficiency of the Indian real estate market because of the dampener uh, that this situation puts on it. And, and the blockchain is going to be able to completely uh, eliminate at the source all of that. So interestingly, you can go to a politician and ask, how much do you want to damage the economy? How much do you want to hurt the people? How much do you want to keep a community impoverished because you are delaying the adoption of technologies like blockchain that could benefit everybody? And what is your interest in doing that? Um, in the long term, I see uh, basically the same thing uh, that I mentioned with the, the wrapper and the car happening in buildings as well. Um, 10 years ago, I would tell people that uh, we would have uh, internet connected chairs and doors and windows, and they would laugh, uh, but hotel rooms, are universally uh, connected in a network today. When you go in your room and you tap the key to the uh, to the um, uh, to the lock, the lock asks a computer if it should obey. And uh, we have internet connected uh, um, light bulbs. You know, I I have a an internet connected light light bulb right here and and i can program it so that if i am in a crime ridden area the bulb will turn on and turn off in a random sequence mimicking a human in the home even if i am not there so that uh, thieves are deterred as they see the lights turning on and off as i move supposedly from the living room to the bedroom. Now, the additional cost, the incremental cost of making things internet connected, 
making things blockchain enabled, making things able to transact is going to go practically to zero. That means that in a building, everything will be internet connected right from the start as you build it to the component level and maintenance and valuation and uh, accommodating the personal preferences of uh, owners or renters as they stay there, reconfiguring the building dynamically because walls move around uh, as you design them in virtual reality and, and uh, uh, the day after you take ownership of an office space, it becomes the way that you saw it the day before in your visor. These are the things that are going to happen in real estate. But let me tell you a secret. Can I? Yes, please do. The biggest change is going to come as we realize that unsustainability is unsustainable and we have to be able to build uh, on planet Earth uh, without uh, negatively impacting uh, the environment. Uh, we have done it for the past million years and we thought we could keep doing it, but now we are realizing we, we must stop. And one of the things that is going to enable us to do that is one of Elon Musk's experiments. The boring company is uh, aiming to decrease 10 times the cost of um, building tunnels. But they will soon realize that this cost reduction is not only for tunnels, it is for anything that you want to build. And, and so much of our life is already in an artificial world that for many of us, being above ground or below ground, it is just a question of a high definition, um, a, 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 an ultra high definition screen window showing us the, the landscape outside. It is, it is not necessarily the case that we should be above ground. So my prediction, and it doesn't have to do with blockchain, but, I'm, uh, but it does have to do with, with exponential technologies, is that the cost of building luxury dwellings is going to become available to every human on the planet. And all of those buildings will uh, house uh, not seven, but 10 billion people or more. And it will happen invisibly from the surface. There will be parks, there will be um, forests, there will be wild animals, and, and we will thrive in these environments that will have the quality that only the most luxurious uh, places, you know, the penthouse floor apartments have uh, in Manhattan that sell for $50 million. And, and that is going to happen thanks to 3D printing, to Internet of Things, to uh, optimization in logistics, and uh, it will happen sustainably. It will happen in a manner that uh, we can start thinking about already and that uh, forward-looking entrepreneurs like you can start planning for when it is, when it is happening. So David, it brings me on to my last question, and I, I actually fairly well linked, is that you know, what do you think, you've often spoken when I've been with you around minimum basic income, and um, you've got a better acronym for it, and, um, and you know, property almost to the point of what you've just discussed, you know, et cetera. You know, I, every single human being on the planet knows the value of property, and whether they've got access to it or not is a separate conversation. What is your thoughts, and, and it's my final question in terms of the, that, that big picture, and it ties very, very closely with what you just said already, that 7 to 10 billion people are housed, because that's a good start to start off with. You know? Absolutely, and you can calculate what it means. And, and if we calculate it uh, with today's 
uh, uh, mentality, someone could say, oh my God, the value of real estate will crash because if everybody has a luxurious building, then uh, how can I sell my Manhattan penthouse at 100 million rather than 50 million, right? Now, obviously wrong because uh, the differences in uh, individual preferences, uh, the uh, ability of doing more uh, with what is possible is uh, going to be there. Uh, we are not going to be living uh, in a, in a uh, hyper-equalized uh, world, uh, which we would hate. Um, and I am not even worried about uh, what uh, the super-rich uh, do. Uh, do they want to go to Mars? I want them to go to Mars because only by the super rich going to Mars will make Mars travel affordable for those that cannot afford it at the beginning. And I want to go to Mars and maybe come back as well. Uh, as well as if Martian colonies are necessarily a completely enclosed and, and uh, uh, um, a completely sustainable environment, their main export towards planet Earth will be the ability to build those environments because we will need them here as well. Rather than minimum basic income, I like to talk about uh, minimum basic wealth. Uh, the participation in the global human civilization is a privilege that we have because we are born and whether we participate uh, at a small degree or at a large degree depends on so many things depends on our genetic lottery depends on our geographical lottery and both will become moot in the future we will be able to free people from uh, whatever losing ticket they draw from the genetic lottery through genetic modification uh, of both embryos and adults and, and uh, stopping somebody from improving themselves genetically will be a crime. And we will be able to free people from the burden of being born in a place that doesn't enable them to thrive without uh, the current conflict, which is predicated on the concept of arbitrary invisible lines on a map, uh, we call the, uh, uh, the borders. Now, the reason why the participation in the human civilization is going to be recognized as worthy of generating wealth is because either as consumers of products or, of, or services, or producers of, of products and services, or thinkers and creators, or caretakers of other human beings, we will find ways of being part of this ecosystem, of this civilization. And the technologies that drive abundance in food production, in the availability of information, in the uh, availability of entertainment, uh, in the opportunity to learn from each other, um, in, in supporting uh, security and, and uh, financial uh, independence. These are all things that are going to become available to, to everybody. Let me give you an example of a funny abundance and uh, uh, an unintended consequence of, of, of that that I personally feel and I ask the few people they feel it as well and I am curious to hear if you feel it too. Um, Netflix is a very popular subscription service that is able to show you movies or TV series to watch, uh, improving the recommendation based on the things that you watched in the past or you said you liked. 
and their catalog is enormous they have an enormous catalog of movies or tv series that at any point you could decide to watch this is the abundance part what is the unintended consequence i spend some evenings more time curating my watch list what are the things that i may watch ending the evening without having watched any of the movies or tv shows than not the nights that i actually decide to watch something and this kind of emergent behavior is is astonishing to me i remember when black and white television showing maybe two channels but i would guess one was totally crappy but whatever it would show we would watch because there was no alternative and now we are living in a completely different world so are we all going to be happy no many of us will find ways to complain anyway but the attitude is going to matter a lot and for many of us the world of the future is going to be even more full of exciting developments uh, and opportunities and uh, we will thrive and, and and just have so much fun as as uh, we are having hopefully tonight together um, and and there will be so much to learn and so much to do David, you know, thank you so much uh, for for your time and um, your wealth of knowledge. And you know, it's interesting when you talk about that that personalization of Netflix. You know, I see the same personalization when it comes to people creating their own wealth they want in their lives. You know, they won't be put in boxes anymore. It'll be what suits them, what's their requirements. And um, I, I love what you said about attitude as well. And um, if you if you if you don't mind, and I know we've gone over, it, but I just wanted to wrap up what the digital real estate mastermind was, and then there were a couple of questions. Do you mind if I just wrap it up in five minutes, and then we go? You know, it will be here. Perfect. So, just in terms of for the, for those of you who are here, you know, for me, I think David absolutely epitomised tonight uh, what the digital real estate mastermind is all about. It's bringing the best authorities in the world together. We we really inviting you on a journey. This is not a course. You're not going to pass and fail this course because as you can understand, things are adapting, they're growing, they're changing each and every day, week and month. But we're going on a journey. And what, what I find absolutely interesting is that, you know, whether you take crypto, blockchain, exponential technology, future trends, customers of the future, or even global real estate, what is interesting is that there's plenty of courses out there. You can literally go and, uh, you know, there's plenty of courses, there's plenty of masterminds, there's plenty of events. But what there isn't anywhere in the world is where you bring it all together within the property real estate space and you look at all these ways that technology is going to disrupt the property industry and you understand it you get to grips with it and then ultimately you get to be able to take advantage of it what we bring together with the digital real estate mastermind is that we're going to have six global authorities and you know i'm hoping that david is is one of those global authorities where each and every month they will be bringing out uh, just in simple terms a short five to eight minute video where they basically will just be sharing with you. Uh, I like to think of it like a TED talk. You know, what is the what has just changed this month? You know, like you know, Dave, you spoke about uh, David, you spoke about tzero.com. You know, most of us don't have the time to go and scour the world and try and find out what's happening in all these trends. And so, just a short, curated, and and it's what I call compressing time. Then, just like we've done tonight, every month we'll go deep with one authority in terms of one area, one space. Um, in terms of where we're at. We're also going to be compiling, putting together a quarterly report, taking into account what's happening in terms of the, the latest technology trends and the latest property trends, marrying it together uh, from a global perspective. We're going to have a digital real estate library where if, if I find a great report on blockchain or, or something like that, we're going to put it in there and or one of the authorities in terms of, in terms of where we're going. We're going to have a closed blog, Telegram groups and Facebook groups so that we can learn and grow together. We're going to have our annual wealth movement events, and now you know David hasn't actually been involved in one of these because uh, we didn't haven't held one in the last uh, two years. But really, annual conferences in terms of bringing people together 
so that we can, you know, again, as much as we're going digital, people still want to get together. And then finally, we're going to have online groups, you know, for our masterminders to be able to learn and, and, and grow together. As an example, next month, we've spoken about digi uh, distributed autonomous organizations or DAOs as they're better known. Next month, Paul Niederer is the, the expert. I mean, he is literally a, uh, just like David, a globally recognized person. He actually, you know, built and ran the very first crowdfunding site in the world, um, actually out of Australia. He's recognized out of China in terms of blockchain. He's currently working on some amazing projects. And so he'll be someone just like we've done with David going a lot deeper. And so if this is something of interest to you, what we need to do and, and what is not possible is someone like David is not free. Um, in fact, his, uh, his speaking engagements are, are you know, upwards of $20,000 at time. And so what we need to do if we want to get access to the best information is that we need to be able to monetize it so that we can make it worth the authorities' uh, time to be able to share with us. And so we've got a couple of options. The annual option that it's going to cost for people to participate in this over 12 months is going to be $999, and, and that's effectively a 30% 30, uh, 30 discount off the total cost. All people can do three payment options of uh, $382.95, which works out at $1148, and all they can do it monthly, uh, which is $108 a month um, in terms of the process. Now, something that we're really excited about is, is we wanted to launch it tonight. We, we, we're doing it in a, in a free um, beta version tonight with the intention of from next month it effectively being uh, paid for. And what we are going to do in the next seven days is that if people participate, uh, they can actually get it for $899. So effectively a 45% uh, discount. And then the final question I ask people is if you want it for free, uh, how would you actually get it? Well, that one for me is quite an interesting one. And if you do or don't know, we're coming to the end of a highly, highly successful campaign with Cedars. You know, most people only get to participate in technology companies once they list, like a Facebook or an Amazon. You know, most people wish they could have, you know, invested in an Uber or an Airbnb. You don't really want to invest in route, you know, startups. And, you know, someone like Wealth Migrate has, uh, has now got members in 127. I don't even know, David, if you've heard this, 100 members in 127 countries. We've done over. $80 million from 62 different countries through the platform and facilitated over $520 million in, in real estate deals. And so very much a, a growth phase company. We're allowing people to participate in that through the Cedars campaign. Now, it is literally closing as we speak. Um, you can see the link there. I'm very grateful that on numerous occasions, we've actually been the biggest mover and, um, and, and with the most number of investors. We've had over 700 investors and now invest. And if you wanted the digital real estate mastermind for free uh, and, as a matter of interest, the wealth in a circle, then if you invested at a silver level, which is $10,000 or more, you would literally get it for free. And so there's a link there. If you want to go to Wealth Migrate forward slash campaigns, forward slash cedars, forward slash general, you can literally sign up. And um, it's, it's literally closing. Um, well, it actually is due to close uh, today. And uh, we're actually trying to negotiate with Cedars uh, just to reopen it um, till Friday because there's so much latent demand right right at the end. Uh, by the way, we, we, we're super excited. We've smashed uh, over 200% in terms of our funding target, um, which, which is really, really quite interesting. If you want more information, you can go to the Wealth University. It's wealthuniversity.org. And that's where you can learn about our Wealth in the Circle, the, the digital real estate mastermind that we've spoken so much about tonight, and even the global real estate mastermind. As an example on the wealth inner circle, I literally did a webinar two weeks ago. I interviewed Robin Banks. Um, he's a global authority in terms of mind power. And, and my big belief is that you can't start the year, you can't, you can't have a successful year unless you're in control of your mind. And he's, and, you know, it's interesting because David actually finished off tonight about your attitude, and it's the same thing. And he shared um, you know, some amazing, I mean, I woke up so pumped for 2019. So if you want the recordings of this, you know, and you join the digital uh, real estate mastermind, you'll, you'll get access to it. James Painter, the gentleman I shared already tonight, you know, he's got this incredible roadmap and he didn't only share in terms of cryptos, he shared in terms of, you know, all the fiat currencies as well. And then I also did a bonus around uh, goals. I'm a big believer in terms of, you know, if you've got clarity on where you want to get to, uh, not only with your life goals, your yearly, your quarterly, your weekly, I've got some, you know, big systems. I, um, we, and, I, and I shared with people as to how they could do that. And then the Global Real Estate Mastermind is launching uh, next week. 
and there's only going to be 10 people that are going to participate that. It's going to be like-minded people that ultimately want to become global citizens and are going to hold each other accountable uh, in terms of where we go. And so if you want more information to that, just go to wealthuniversity.org. In terms of the next steps, and then we'll go to a Q&A, uh, the first thing is that if you want to sign up for the launch promotion for the Digital Real Estate Mastermind, just go to this link. So it's surveymonkey forward slash r forward slash digital mastermind. And uh, again, if you go to wealthuniversity.org, you'll, you'll get there. I'm just making it easier uh, for you. The only option that is available at the moment is the one-off payment of $8.99 for the whole of 2019. Um, we will have the other options coming, the quarterly and the monthly, um, but quite frankly, we have to build the technology uh, to allow that to happen. So if you are interested, just go to the survey, uh, fill in the Jernston, one of the other options. I don't know when it will become available. Um, and again, it's quite a long survey. The more you fill in, the more we'll be able to add value to you. But if you just want to fill in your name and you know which option you're interested in, then those are the only two uh, compulsory options. And you know you can see the survey uh, here if I just bounce uh, through it quickly. This is the digital real estate uh, survey. And there's literally two questions you have to fill in if you're interested in being involved in this package, You know any of the packages. If you really want to get value out of this mastermind, there's a whole bunch of questions around uh, around exponential and digital and, and ultimately uh, the real estate side. And then the final thing, if you want it for free, um, we're literally closing in the next uh, 48 hours and um, you would have to go online to that link and, um, you know, and, and, and sign up and, and uh, you know, let the team know and, and try and reserve your spot before we close out. Um, we, we, we already actually are effectively closed um, and we're pleading with Cedars to just reopen for uh, 48 hours um, because of the, the so much demand and if you're not interested no problem um, but as I like to joke with people then let's race to the future because clearly as David shared there's a tremendous amount of uh, trends that are happening around the world and it's not a case of if it's going to happen it's a case of when and how and um, you know if you don't want to participate with global authorities then uh, <laughs> then let's have a race to the future um, I certainly believe in nature's principles which is that a bird flying on its own in comparison with a bird flying in a flock can fly 70% further. And uh, I don't in any way doubt that uh, a lot of my knowledge comes from, you know, the, my gratitude of being able to hang around people like yourself, David, um, you know, because you, 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 you're way ahead of me in terms of what you're learning. And if I can only bring that together and share with other people, I've got tremendous gratitude. And that's, and that's what the Digital Real Estate Mastermind uh, is all about. So let's, uh, let's see if there's a couple of questions here. Um, I will put in the links and uh, uh, quickly let me pull up the polls. I will run a couple of polls as well just to see what people are thinking while I ask some questions. So, um, David, the first question, which, uh, which you know, comes up a lot of times, people say, is cryptocurrency going to go to zero? And um, I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that. I'd, and tell me if you need me to, to mute again. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, yes, it can go to zero uh, if uh, there is an asteroid uh, hitting Earth and wiping out human civilization. Uh, there will be no trace of uh, uh, of, of uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies anymore, right? Um, the question is not if it goes to zero. The question is, um, can you be patient enough that if it goes down and down and down you don't panic because if you sell when it is down you do nothing than locking in your losses i'm not saying that i will be necessarily right you know we can take note and meet here in 10 years and see how bitcoin or blockchain is doing and uh, whether you know there's going to be a new name for the leading uh, uh, blockchain-based uh, store of value and uh, uh, unit of exchange, we will see. Uh, if you listen to uh, people uh, making a deep argument of why um, blockchain and cryptocurrencies are a useful tool, why Bitcoin will become more and more popular and used by more and more people in the future, well, then you can draw your own conclusions and then you can decide what is potentially a fraction of your um, investable 
uh, wealth that you want to put into Bitcoin, for example, or Ether or, or anything else. Uh, and and uh, um, if, if it goes down, resist uh, panicking. Fantastic, fantastic. And um, there's another good question here that someone was asking about, um, hang on, let me get the question here quickly. And uh, so I'm just getting that slide up because a couple of people have asked for those links. So I'm just going to leave that slide on while we're doing this. Um, where was it here? It was about cell phones. Uh, give me two seconds. Uh, there's a crypto called Pundi X who have launched a cell phone on the blockchain making calls through blockchain. Does David think this will successfully disrupt the cell phone industry? Uh, so I am not familiar specifically with that uh, project. Um, hardware is very hard and hundreds of millions of dollars are not enough to uh, make a hardware company successful, uh, especially consumer hardware. Very, very, very hard, very capital intensive. But sometimes hardware companies succeed. DJI, the drone company out of China, dominates its category. Um, in terms of peer-to-peer -peer communication, um, definitely a decentralized infrastructure is far superior, much more resilient, uh, enables new degrees of freedom that otherwise we wouldn't have. Uh, already, if we are sitting together, our phones should be exchanges apps by themselves because they know we what we are interested in them but no current architectures require the phones to go across entire continents to download the app from a centralized data center through desirable vulnerabilities um, with our attention being invested in in this act of of uh, understanding that you have an app that I also want and then proceeding to download, this is stupid. So uh, a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized uh, communication network that supports machine-to-machine um, -machine as well as human-to-human -human communication with the help of blockchain is smart, absolutely. But again, I am not familiar about the specifics of that project. Perfect. So. Um... The next question I had here, and just for those of you, you'll see I've got the poll up, and I'm I'm really fascinated to see what uh, you know what different people think in terms of which options suit them. Um, so if you wouldn't mind filling that in now, and then I can uh, close off the poll. But um, the next one is uh, it's quite an interesting question. To some extent you answered it, but I think it's worth revisiting. How is blockchain different from the internet? Um, when the internet was born. Um, it was a research project um, out of the Defense Department, and then it was enhanced uh, through the web by another research project out of uh, Europe uh, at CERN. And both totally ignored commercial uses of the internet to the point that when these applications were allowed because initially they were prohibited. Desperate, we adopted a 70-year-old decrepit technology in order to be able to transact over the internet we call credit cards. And 30 years later, we are still here surprised about how inefficient how cumbersome and how vulnerable the whole system is so if nothing else just the ability to pay uh, in an unfettered manner anybody any amount without um, the, the the cumbersome limitations and vulnerabilities of the banking system and the credit card system just this would justify uh, blockchain and Bitcoin and, and other payment systems. Uh, 
and and tremendously enhance uh, the internet. Um, but it can do so much more. Uh, on the internet, we don't have the identity system that people are now working on extending both to people and to objects and to, to, to smart connected objects using blockchain. On, on the internet, we don't have uh, um, the uh, decentralized uh, ways of, of uh, delegating the execution of programs uh, where we know that the program is going to be executed, uh, we call smart contracts. There are so many things that blockchain uh, uh, introduces and makes possible. It requires the internet to exist, so the internet will exist. Uh, but the the most exciting things are going to start happening uh, on top of the internet, on top of the blockchain. Awesome. Um, someone asked, uh, Leslie asked, is there going to be a replay? So yes, there will be a replay. Traditionally, we put these things up on uh, YouTube. So this this week, definitely, Leslie, going forward, once it's a paid for, uh, it will be you know behind a, a login, um, you know for the you know for the people that are part of a digital real estate mastermind. Um, I think uh, Gavin asked the question, what is the difference between a utility and a security token? And I think you've um, you know I think you've answered that uh, already. Um, uh, Peter made a made a comment that there's an exchange open on the 7th of January called DX.exchange that offers trading on digitized stocks like Apple and Amazon 24 hours a day. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, David. Uh, I wasn't. Fantastic. I welcome that kind of innovation. <coughs> uh, there are others that are very much needed as well. For example, the ability to uh, trade fractional uh, units of stock. Uh, Apple and Amazon are expensive stocks. Not everybody can afford to own an entire unit of stock, right? So being able to trade a tenth or a hundredth of Apple stock, why not? Yeah, no, I co completely agree. There's actually a very successful platform in South Africa uh, called Easy Equities that does that. So effectively fractionalizing uh, stocks. Uh, Manu said, um, what, Avid is, uh, what David is talking about is Oh, she, I can't pronounce this word. I got no idea. E P H E M E R A L I Z A T I O N. Um, uh, basically, uh, doing uh, more with less, which is what Bucky Filler um, you know, said many, many years ago. I don't know if you know what that word is. I can't pronounce it. Euphemerialism. I've got no idea. <laughs> Manu, thank you for that. I'm sorry I can't pronounce it. Um, then Gavin just asked, um, obviously we've had some debates around the timing of uh, the wealthy coin and going on to an exchange and you know, you and I have personally had conversations around this and uh, the fact that it's very volatile at the moment, we should, you know, we should maybe wait for a little bit more consistency. Any thoughts around that, David, you know, in terms of, um, you know, as an investor, you're an investor, I'm an investor, Gavin's an investor, um, you know, just, just be interested to, to get your take on it. Sure. So. Um... The, the, the new regulatory framework that in Malta enables uh, uh, exchanges to operate with a clarity and the tokens that are listed to know that there is no uh, market manipulation, for example, happening, market makers that uh, uh, assure liquidity, all these things are coming together. Uh, and um, uh, there will be uh, many ways that uh, we will be able to work uh, together uh, investors on, on, on one hand, uh, wealth migrate on the other hand, uh, to, to, to decide when is the right time for the wealthy token to be listed uh, and for people to be able to buy it, for people uh, to be able to sell it. Uh, you know, to say that it will take three months or six months, uh, I am uh, hesitant to, to put a specific date, uh, but uh, I, I don't think it will take uh, too long, uh, and we will be able to to start allowing people to to both uh, purchase and sell uh, those tokens, but also to apply those tokens to all the various uses within the platform that uh, will enhance their ability to to operate, and that will make uh, the airplanes uh, a winged and flying machine. 
rather than a clipped box in uh, thing. Excellent. I'm very conscious of your time, and I only asked for an hour of it, so I'm going to I'm going to finish off with this last question from Kate because I think it's a good way to finish off. You did mention some numbers earlier, but Kate said, "When do you feel Bitcoin will hit its peak, and what do you think its peak will be?" Which is a which is a good way to finish off. It's a it's a crystal ball, and uh, you know I suppose it's how long's a piece of string because is it its peak at the end of this year or at the end of the century? You know. So so uh, contrary to fiat money, which is inflationary. Bitcoin is inherently deflationary. Uh, there is a finite amount of Bitcoin that will ever be uh, minted, uh, and uh, we will start resorting to uh, ever finer slices, ever smaller fractions of Bitcoin for the, the kinds of exchanges that we do. Um, potentially, uh, there is no reason, theoretically, there is no reason why uh, this, uh, if, if we keep Bitcoin as a, a store of wealth and as a unit of, of, of uh, exchange, uh, as, a, uh, as a unit of account, for, for Bitcoin not to be applied to larger and larger um, and more and more valuable physical goods or services. And just to give you an idea, um, when we have uh, swarms of intelligent robots mining the asteroid belt, they are not going to transact in uh, paper money or coins, metal coins, or, or they are not going to carry around their checkbooks uh, or, or, or credit cards they are going to transact uh, in something that we call today blockchain. And if Bitcoin is still around at the time, and there is no reason for it not to be around, there is literally quadrillion dollars worth of wealth, newly created wealth, in an open economy that is going to influence Bitcoin's valuation. So there will be a point when we will stop measuring Bitcoin in dollars uh, because it will make no sense anymore. Uh, the US dollar or the Euro uh, will be used as long as you must pay your taxes in them and we will go and buy them for the reason. But uh, Bitcoin and crypto and blockchain based economic transactions will be what we do and and uh, uh, there will be enormous value and enormous wealth uh, to be created in the process and uh, all of you will share in it. David thank you very much for your time there's some great questions still coming in but I'm conscious of the time um, you know, Albrecht has asked a great question here about IoT and 5G in America or China. But I did want to share with people the, the whole idea behind the Digital Real Estate Mastermind. And this is another mastermind that, that I'm part of. People will be able to put down questions and we'll look for trends and we'll like look to answer long you know questions, etc. So, you know, for me, um, I'm not going to ask you to answer that. And the questions keep coming. We could probably spend another two hours here in terms of where we're going. You know. uh, take note of the questions. And we will schedule another um, another conversation. Uh, and and of course, this is a journey that we are doing together. You are very kind, and 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 you believe that I have a lot of to teach, a lot to teach. But believe me, I am learning through the questions as much as you are learning from my answers. And no, no, uh, and, I, and, and I really appreciate that. And I think for the people that are part of the digital real estate mastermind, we we're going to be joining on a journey together you know hopefully you know you you go you, you you're going to be involved in that and myself and, and other incredible people like yourself and then with a group of people we're going to be going on this journey together so um you know for me this is certainly uh, not the end it's it's actually the beginning you know if that makes sense yep so i mean on that note i'm going to uh, i'm going to say thank you to everyone that's been involved it's it's really been a lovely session uh, david as always i'm uh, I'm intrigued by what I learned from you. Your your knowledge is is phenomenal. 
Um, your depth of knowledge always amazes me, no matter what the questions are. Um, it, it really is an honor and a privilege to be able to spend uh, spend time with you. And, and, and very much, I'm super grateful for your time. Thank you for, for sharing with, with everybody. And, you know, I really think that you epitomize uh, what the Digital Real Estate Mastermind is supposed to be all about, you know, in terms of not only someone with deep knowledge, but someone that's prepared to share and give people insights in terms of where the future is going so that they're not wandering around in the dark. They can actually, you know, participate and, and hopefully profit uh, in a purposeful way from, from where the future is going. So thank you so much for your time, David. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. Good night to everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, don't forget about the uh, seven-day... Uh, um, seven day bonus if you want to participate uh, literally by next Wednesday um, we'll be closing that out and or you know get involved in Cedars and become a shareholder like David and I and many other people on this call are and then you can make one plus one equal 11. Good night. Cheers.